really excited to be here. Um, and I realized that I'm the last thing standing between us and happy hour and the end of the conference. So I promise to keep you awake. I promise to keep you engaged. And I hope to keep you entertained. And so we are going to have an interactive session here. So this session, it's on belonging and connection. And I'm just curious by a show of hands, who here has experienced a true sense of what you would consider belonging and connection at work in any job you've ever had? OK. Most people. All right. What does that mean to you? Let's just go popcorn style. You can speak freely. What does belonging and connection mean to you? You can be yourself. OK. Great. You got a hand raised behind. Sorry? I'm heard. You're heard. OK. You had your hand raised. <laughs> OK. What else? You feel like your feedback matters, okay. You feel like you're at the right place, like this is where you belong. Yep, you feel like you're at the right place where you belong, okay. Anything else? It's like a sense of family, I guess. Sense of family, yeah, precisely. All right, what does it feel like when you're disconnected? Who's felt disconnected and in a sense of not belonging at work? Yeah, I see some heads nodding, big time. What did that feel like? Uncomfortable? Not valued. Sorry? Not valued. Not valued. Stressful. Stressful. Your days are numbered. Your days are numbered. <laughs> yeah. OK. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of story here. I love storytelling. You're going to hear a few throughout this presentation. Uh, my first job when I was 16 years old, who remembers Wolf Camera from the 80s, 90s? Early 2000s, yeah. So I was 16 years old, and I got my first job at Wolf Camera. Mind you, this is back in the 90s. This is in the days of 35 millimeter film. So I was developing other people's film. And if you want to learn a lot about people and have a real eye-opening job when you're 16 years old, <laughs> go and develop other people's film. You see some things. You don't want to see all those things. <laughs> You don't want to know that much about your neighbors. <laughs> it gets weird. <laughs> so, and, and another thing that I had to do is I eventually was moved to the sales floor. And I was selling cameras. I'm 16, 17, 18 years old. And you know, I'm selling cameras. I'm also helped still developing other people's film. And I'm having to deal with people who had just gotten back from a once in a lifetime vacation to Italy and their little point-and-shoot camera, the flash on that thing extends about 12 feet. And the guy positioned his wife about 14 feet away from him, trying to get their iconic photo in front of the Colosseum. And he's pissed as to why he can't see his wife. Tensions are escalating. <laughs> and I can't look at him and tell him, well, you just took a bad photo. You know, I have to explain to him. But the sense of connection and belonging that I felt was when I would see my coworkers out of the corner of my eyes just kind of start to creep my way. And they wouldn't necessarily intervene, but I knew they were listening, and I knew they had my back. Because here I am, 16, I'm getting yelled at by some 50-year-old guy about something that is completely out of my control. He thinks he's a National Geographic photographer <laughs> on his vacation in Italy with his $100 point shoot camera. <laughs> Again, I can't say that. But that was the first time I ever really felt a true sense of connection and belonging at work. And then fast forward to my first job out of college. I was doing IT recruiting for an IT recruiting firm that let's just say was less than ethical. And that really bothered me. And I didn't understand why it wasn't just like my job at Wolf Camera. Because I had felt so connected. I knew, my, you know, I knew my coworkers had my back. We did feel a little bit like family. That's a fine line to walk when we're in the corporate world. But we all know that feeling. We know that feeling when you feel like you are connected and like you belong. 
So we're going to start with some data here. Deloitte recently did a study where they surveyed, where half of the survey respondents were C-suite executives and half of the survey respondents were employees. But they were answering the same questions about the employees. 84%. This is the number that the C-suite rated the mental health of their employees excellent or good. So 84% 84 of the C-suite in the survey rated the mental health, rated the, uh, the mental health of their employees excellent or good. Would anyone like to venture a guess at the number that the employees themselves rated their own mental health excellent or good? 12%. 12%. That, that's a little low. Okay. All right. Thankfully, it's not quite that low. It's 59%. Pretty good, but when we're talking about mental health, <laughs> there's still a 25-point gap in terms of how the C-suite perceived the, the mental health of their employees versus how the employees rated their own mental health. Furthermore, 91% of the C-suite respondents said that they care about the well-being of their employees. Like they view themselves as I as a C member of the C-suite care about the mental about the well-being of my employees. Anyone want to venture a guess what the employees thought about the C-suite caring about their well-being? 35. It's still it's not quite that low. It's not actually that far. <laughs> it's not that far from Yeah, we don't we don't need to go like dumpster diving here. <laughs> it's the data's not great, but it's not that bad. <laughs> 56%. 56%. But that's still a 35-point gap in terms of employees thinking the C-suite cares about them and the C-suite thinking that they care about their employees. But what I see here is opportunity. Right now, post-pandemic, or we're still in it, we don't know, we're not sure, it's unclear. Maybe there's another one starting. <laughs> we now have the single biggest opportunity in business culture, in the business world that we have seen in a generation to change things. And what I am suggesting is that we fill that gap with connection and belonging because we know there is a disconnect. You just saw it in the data. 25 point gap and then a 35 point gap. We can sit here and talk about this all day long. You can go back to your offices, you can talk about culture, you can talk about connection and belonging. But we all know the key is we have to live it. If you're not living it day to day, if you've only written it down, if your company values only appear on your website and no one's talking about them, no one's actually acting on them, what does it really matter? So I ask you, are you all ready to live it right now? Because we're going to do this. <laughs> we're going to get real interactive real fast. Is everybody up for that? Okay. So I need everybody to stand up and pair one-on-one -on -one with somebody you don't know. I know, I hear, I'm hearing some groans. Everybody just got a little uncomfortable. Okay. Okay, does everyone, all right, I need your attention again. Does everyone have a partner? Yes. If you do not have a partner, if you're a group of three, the third person's partnered with me, and I will play. We just need we need one on one though. You're in pairs, just pairs, just pairs. And if someone's fine solo, come on up here. You're gonna play with me. All right. So we're gonna make some agreements real quick. The first agreement. 
Only speak, when you leave this room, only speak of your own experience. Please do not speak of the experience of anybody else, including your partner. Can we all agree to that level of privacy? Yes. Good. Okay. Can we also agree to lean into curiosity over criticism or judgment? Yes, we agree. Cool. I know everybody's hesitant because you have no idea what's about to happen. <laughs> it's okay. I've, y'all, I've got you. I've got you. This is, this is okay. We're building, we're building up the tension. It's all going to be okay. I've done this dozens of times, I promise. The third agreement, we've all heard of the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. We're actually going to agree to the platinum rule, treat others as they want to be treated. Can we all agree to the platinum rule? Agreed. We've got our three agreements. Okay. So what's going to happen is the person with the lighter colored hair, and if you can't quite figure that out, just choose, I know, I said that, I'm looking at y'all in the front row, and I'm like, oh, okay, you're, you're going you're gonna to go first, okay? Just, just choose someone, okay? So you're going to go first. The person with the lighter colored hair, you're going to be the speaker. And what you are going to do, and then, sorry, you're going to be the speaker. The other person is just going to listen. You're not going to reflect back. You're not going to try to think ahead. You're just purely going to listen. You can nod. You can give a little uh-huh here and there. But beyond that, you're not going to speak. You're purely listening. And so the person who's going to begin speaking, you're just going to share. I'm going to, I'm going to have a timer. And at the end, you're going to hear this. Is that too loud for everybody? All right. Sorry. I won't do that right in front of the microphone. Apologies. Um, but when you hear that noise, you're going to wrap it up. And the speaker, what you're going to, what you're going to uh, speak on right now is you're just going to share anything that would make you arrive in this moment and be more present in this space. And what that means is what's burning inside you right now that needs a voice, that needs to be shared. Is it the weight of a really heavy work week? Is it the joy of something great that happened this week? Is it somebody you met at this conference that really lit you up? Is it one of the sessions? Anything that would just allow you to be more present and arrive in this moment. We all good there? You think so? Yeah. Can, you, can you give a better example, please? I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure, so I just want to... No, that's fair. Yeah, 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 that's fair. So is it the problem that we're having or something that bothers you? You choose. Yeah, you choose. It could be that. It could be, you know, something that it's just whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind in this moment. You know, is there some energy that needs to be cleared? Is there something that just needs to be said? Is there something weighing on you? Is there, you know, a, a really joyous thing happening in your life that's coming up? Is that, is that helpful? We good? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Speakers, begin.
I love these things. They're wildly effective than me just yelling at y'all. All right. What was that like for everyone? A little awkward, yeah. As a listener, it was hard for me not to like, want to say something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Been there. What else? It felt real. It felt real, OK. For me, it was relaxing. Relaxing, OK. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Brother, I feel you on that. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Sorry? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to reverse, but not in the way that maybe you think. The listener, you are now going to just reflect back to the person you're with what you heard them say. Not your interpretation of it, not necessarily, I mean, you can put some of it in your own words because, you know, but it's as if you were a mirror. What I heard you say was blank. We good? All right, go. Bring it to a close. What was that like for everybody? It was good. I felt seen. Yep. Okay. What else? I think it was a little intimidating um, because it was like, did I interpret what she was not interpret, but did I really hear her? Oh, yeah. That can be a terrifying moment. <laughs> because when I announce what the instructions are, yeah. like, I know that feeling of like, oh my gosh. I've been there, y'all. I've done this exercise. I promise. I'm with you. Okay? <laughs> so, but yeah. It made me feel so much more connected to her. And uh -huh. what was coming up for me was if, if I were in the workplace, that's some, the things that she told me were things that I probably wouldn't share with a colleague unless mm. I really got to know them. But it's exactly the thing that would make me feel closer to that person, feel like I could trust them, um, work with them, work better with them. Yeah. Mm. There we go, that sticky factor. You had, you had raised your hand. Um, well, the first time when he was telling me, I wanted to reply. And so now I got my chance to reply, so it was a bit of relief. Just like, you know, yeah. Relief, what you're saying, I get it. You know. Yeah, absolutely. First, I feel thankful, and then I feel supported. Mm, yeah, thankful and supported. Yeah. What else? Anything else? Yeah. Some people might be, yeah, but they couldn't relay what he said, but she really listened and felt like the emotion that that man was hearing about what he 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Great. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. Could the people in the back hear what he was saying? Yeah. No. Yeah, he was saying, he, he was really wanting to respond kind of from his own uh, experience and to say, oh, me too. And, you know, apparently she was sharing some stuff where, like, some guy needs his butt kicked and he was really wanting to, like, call him up and be like, yo, like, you're messing with my girl. <laughs> like, get away. <laughs> so, is that, is that an accurate summary of what I did? <laughs> Okay. All right. So now, so, so we're in the, in, in the interest of fairness. Um, you're going to switch roles again. The person who was originally speaking, you are now going to get the chance to share. So go for it. Who was listening first? Yes. Now the other person's had their turn to speak. You know what I'm going to ask you. What was that like? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, you want to get clarification. Yeah. What else? A little bit more comfortable sharing of her diary. Yeah. Yeah, this round's always a little bit easier. Everybody's kind of dropped in. You're already connected. And so kudos to the people that went first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll get to you. Go. Sorry. I'll get to you next. <laughs> mm. Interesting. OK. Yeah. Right. And then, Yeah, yeah. And well, and how did you feel? Um, I, I felt very understanding. I could definitely empathize with her. Mm -hmm. I, I felt bad for her. Like, I wanted to be like, oh, you know, we're going to do this. And we're gonna 
<laughs> yeah. Y'all two need to get together. Yeah. Y'all, you got the A team right here. You're like, all right, we're going to get some. Yeah. <laughs> Selfish? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for following. Thank you for following. One last one. Yes. You're going to hear me say that a lot more in the next half hour. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Y'all know what's coming. The listeners, now you're going to reflect back. Go for it. Right, well, yeah, now you know what it's like to be in the seat. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask one last time, what was that like for everybody? So I'm going to, so for me, it's a very vulnerable thing. Yeah. Right, and then having, and even hearing it come back to me, like, okay, this person got it, and gosh, it's heavy, you know? So it's just a very vulnerable thing, but it's also kind of empowering. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I've heard the word heavy a few times. Y'all are getting in some deep stuff with strangers here. I like it. I like it. I, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. What else? You felt safe. Yeah, you felt safe because she's not at your workplace. So, gotcha. I, mean, I realized that I've not had that done in a long time. Someone just listened to this. Wow, this is different. No one's just listened to you in a long time. What I just was looking at a group to do. Yeah. So she told me the same thing I told them to do because I wasn't showing it for myself, and nobody listened and told me. You know what? You just been told me to do what I just now told a group to do. Yeah. So you've been listening to other people, but no one's been listening to you because you haven't because you haven't asked is what I'm what I'm what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm just repeating that for the people in the back. So, what else? One last little comment. Anything? We good? I've yeah. I've never had positive experiences, but I actually felt weird and guilty, like telling a complete stranger or something. I mean, they don't want to hear that crap anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It's 
not something I normally do. Yeah, you felt like you were burdening yeah, the other exactly. person. I was burdening yeah, exactly. Somebody it was something I didn't want to have. Yeah. How did you feel <laughs> as her partner? I felt, I felt sorry for her. Uh huh. <laughs> no, because of what she's going through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel burdened by her, though? No. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. I felt that. I mean, no. Right. Not burdened at all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for showing up so fully to that exercise. I know it was an edge. I know it was a surprise. You weren't expecting that at 3.30 on Friday afternoon. But I hope you all enjoyed it. What we just did, I have a confession to make. I tricked all of you. We just created a mini culture. We just created a mini culture for this session, for this room, for this hour. And we're gonna spend the remaining time unpacking what that means so that you can take this back to your workplaces and you can do your own version of it with the elements that we're about to outline. Does that sound good? Yes. All right, cool. It all starts with intention. Companies often jump to values first in order to create corporate culture, and they skip the intention part. And this, to me, is really doing a disservice because intention is everything. Intention serves as the bedrock for everything that you will create from a corporate culture standpoint and really from a business standpoint moving forward. So if you are not intentional, and if, excuse me, if you haven't defined your intentions, what do we want to achieve with this business? What do we want to achieve with this culture? What do we want to achieve with this team? It's purpose. That's what you're defining in these early stages. I'll tell you a little story. Who's familiar with Zappos, the shoe company? Yeah, some people are probably wearing shoes from Zappos that they ordered in this room. Um, are you familiar with the founder's story of how it got created? No. So, uh, Tony Shea, he did not set out to create a shoe company. He set out to create a customer service company. He didn't care what he was doing as long as it was laser focused on customer service. He never saw Zappos as a shoe company. He always saw Zappos as a customer service company. And that is a perfect example of intention because he intended to create a customer service company. And I think he succeeded because you could order 20 pairs of shoes, have them all delivered to your house, try them all on and send 20 pairs back with free shipping. I mean, it's so seamless. I mean, it's so easy. It just happened to be that he did it with shoes. So the manifestation of his intention ended up just being shoes. That was his why. His why was, I want to provide exceptional customer service, essentially at all costs. You know, and this can be debated. <laughs> but the key in your intentions is it defines your why. When you are laying out your intentions, you are laying out your reasons that this company exists, that this culture exists, that this team exists. So get really clear on your intentions first and foremost. From there, you will derive your values. So for example, my intention with this session was to create a mini culture of connection and belonging. Who here thinks that I succeeded? You got some hands, okay. Do you feel more connected and do you feel like you belong more than you did when you walked in the room? See a lot of heads nodding, okay, yeah. It takes time. I've only got an hour. <laughs> Bear with me here. <laughs> but most everybody nodded their heads, that you feel more connected and you feel more belonging. That's all that I wanted. So that was my intention. The values were essentially laid out in those three agreements that we agreed to. One was privacy. We value privacy. We value that in this container. 
we value curiosity over criticism or judgment. And then we value treating the other person how they want to be treated. So those were the values that I set out to, um, to man uh, not manifest. Those are the values that I set for this group. Intention gives your values purpose. Intention is the bedrock for your values. You can sit there, you can put values on a website, you can talk about values, but without intention, there's an emptiness to them because people don't know how to act on those values unless they know the intention behind them. So my intention was to create a mini culture of belonging and connection. I gave you the values and then told you how to act on them, essentially. So you've got three steps. You've got intention, then you've got your values, then you've got how to act on those values, how to bring those values to life. And if you do that in that order, I promise you all, magic will happen. Those three things, intention, values, and action, create what I refer to as the container. We all have, let's say, containers that we exist in, this room being one of them. We've got a finite amount of time. We've got corporate policies that serve as containers. We've got corporate cultures that are outlined and, let's say, less than effective sometimes in terms of actually driving forward an actionable culture of connection and belonging. And so what we did was we created the container. I gave you each two minutes, you shared the container of those, you know, excuse me. Again, going back to the intention. The intention was belonging and connection. The values were privacy, curiosity, and the platinum rule. Those served as the container for the actions that you were able to take in terms of sharing with each other, in terms of listening. And the container it can exist at multiple levels. You've got the overall corporate container from a macro level. You can also have containers on different teams because different teams, as we know, can have different cultures. That's not necessarily a bad thing as long as everybody's swimming in the same direction. You can also have many containers for one-on-one -on -one meetings, and you can have different containers for different meetings that, to try to achieve different purposes. You know, if the meeting is a brainstorm meeting, give everybody five minutes on the clock just to talk. Get it all out there without judgment, lean into curiosity, and then you've got six people in the room and you will have a bunch of ideas on a whiteboard and everyone will have an equal amount of time you know, without judgment and then start to distill it from there. That's just one example. You can move through three, five, six different containers in a single day. And so set the container and do it with intention. Do it from a macro level on down. Because what if you started each one of your one-on-one -on -one meetings with that two minute exercise where you were just able to share what's on your heart, what's on your mind, whether it be work related, whether it be home related, how much more seen, how much more heard, how much more connected would you feel at work if every single one of your one-on-ones started in that manner? I see some heads nodding, I like that. <laughs> so now we get to the shift. Everybody here, unless you're working for a brand new startup, works in an existing corporate culture. The million dollar question is, how do you shift it? How do you take an existing culture and parse out what you want to keep and leave behind what you want to leave behind and instill new values? So we're going to jump into that. First, I'm gonna quote Brene Brown here. I wish I had a quote that was this good of my own. One day, maybe I will. <laughs> True belonging never asks us to change who we are. True belonging requires us to be who we are. 
And so when we're talking about the shift, it's asking questions and it's listening. But really, it's the willingness to sit in the uncertainty of what you might discover. Because you don't necessarily know when you go digging what you're going to discover about your corporate culture. And you've got to be willing to face those things because they are happening regardless of whether you're looking at them or not. The more that you bring it all into the light, the more that you bring it all into this container of transparency, the more effective you will be at driving your corporate culture forward. So the first thing is, are you asking the right questions? And then the willingness to just listen and pause. The power of the pause, I think, is one of the most underrated things in business. How many of y'all have been in that meeting where that guy is just running his mouth because he loves to talk and 20 minutes have gone by and he said very little with a lot of words? <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody, knows, everybody knows that guy, right? Maybe you've been that guy. <laughs> Let's hope not. Um, if you were just willing to pause and just listen, and that's tough in business sometimes, because business wants to keep moving forward. Business wants to keep growing. Business doesn't want to stop. And business wants certitude. Uncertainty in business is terrifying to executive teams, to employees, you know, whether it be layoffs, you know, whatever. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. And you've just got to be willing to sit in that, to be, to be willing to sit in the discomfort of that uncertainty, of what you might discover when you start digging into your corporate culture. But I promise you, what's on the other side is 100% worth it. So everybody knows you've got a spoken and you've got an unspoken culture, right? So your spoken culture, these are the company values on your website. Like how many of y'all can actually, how many of you know your company's values? Everybody, every company has them. Can you name them? I saw one hand <laughs> kind of go up. But not really. <laughs> you put it down real fast. <laughs> yeah. OK. All right. So a vast minority of the room actually knows what their company's values are. Do you think that that matters that you don't know? So OK. So I'm getting some yeses. I'm getting some noes. You know. OK. Yeah. <laughs> But would you be able to describe your company's culture? Depends which department. <laughs> so what'd you say? Depends which department. Depends which department. OK. So we've got yeah, a lot of different corporate cultures. Yeah. Here's the thing. Culture will create itself, period. Culture always creates itself. It's just the difference between are you an active participant in creating that culture, or are you not? So we're familiar with spoken culture. Whoops. I think it's more important to dig into the unspoken culture. And I want to be clear up front. Unspoken culture isn't necessarily a negative thing. There's a lot of great things that can come out of unspoken culture, so it's not immediately bad. The questions you need to ask, though, are what are people whispering about? What are people not saying? And I think one of my favorite questions is, ask your employees, do they, well, actually, it's two things, sorry. One, are they willing to ask for help? Do they feel empowered? Do they feel like they can ask for help without being ridiculed without being shamed, or without being pressured into, oh, well, you can't handle your own stuff. I don't understand why you're putting this on me. That's a real key question that you can ask that will dig up a lot about your unspoken culture in your company. And then the other one, like I said, the whispers and the silence. Who's familiar with the meeting after the meeting? <laughs> yeah. Everybody's kind of nodding here. So we've all been in the meeting after the meeting, or we've been left out of the meeting after the meeting. How many meetings after the meeting are happening in your company? That's another pretty good gauge 
of something that needs to be fixed. Because if you're having to have the meeting after the meeting, well, why'd you have the first meeting in the first place? That's a perfect example of the container not being sound. You haven't really been clear on what you needed to accomplish or who you needed in the, in the room, or maybe the person was included in the room that didn't need to be included and they are the loud mouth, so you had to have the meeting after the meeting to actually get the thing done. So that's another pretty good gauge of defining your spoken versus your unspoken culture. And then from there, start small. Start small. So culture is built in the small moments. It is not built in the big moments. Everybody thinks that culture is, bu is built in these big defining moments of happy hours or you know, companies getting tested and you're in the trenches and you know, it's crisis time or whatever. No, 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 that's when culture gets tested. Culture gets built in the small moments, especially your unspoken culture. And what I mean by small moments is literally it can just be somebody asking you, your manager checking in with you and saying, hey, how are you today? How are you this month? Really, really, really simple stuff that we often overlook. And so pay attention to the small moments. And the other thing is, and I'll come back to small moments in a minute, but start small. Start with one intention. Start with one value and start with one action. And just focus on that for one month. And if you do that 12 times, you will have moved the needle a lot in a year. But what you will discover is in that month where you're just focusing on one intention, one value, and one action, you're going to find a lot of other actions. You're going to find the byproducts and these small mini cultures being built. And it just requires you paying attention. It requires you listening. That's all. So start small. And you can also start small with personnel. It could just be one meeting that you're gonna test something out in. And so one example being start each meeting, and this is especially important for virtual or hybrid environments, start each meeting with a one or a two word check-in. Just go around the room. How are you right now in this moment? You know, somebody's water heater might have burst that morning and you have no idea especially in a virtual environment because you know, it's 11 a.m. and it's that person's first meeting of the day and they haven't talked with anybody and they're stressed out of their mind. So how present can they really be? And how much can we show up for that person to maybe pick up their slack a little bit more today? And probably tomorrow because that's a big disaster and <laughs> it's gonna take a bit. <laughs> probably have wet, stinky carpet in the basement. Um, so yeah, so that's one example of just a small moment. Another example that I'll offer is, especially in work environments, we don't quite use people's names as intentionally as we should. We use them to like call them over or in an email or whatever. And this is gonna seem really, really minute, but instead of asking, how are you today? Say, Jennifer, how are you today? Just use their name when you are asking how they are. I, just, I, just, I heard some sighs there. I heard, I heard the room settle. I felt the room settle after I said that. That's an example of being seen. That's an example of intention. I really, truly want to know how your day is. I really, truly want to know how you are in this moment. So Jennifer. How are you today? <laughs> oh, um. <laughs> a little tired, but yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay, thanks. No, I get it, I get it, I get it. <laughs> yeah. There's a third small moment. Oh, the other thing, yes, the other small moments. <laughs> Follow up. When you ask how someone's day was, 
and they share something, whether it be really good or really bad, maybe they're going to a concert on Thursday, it's Monday, make a note in your calendar to follow up with that person and just ask them how that concert was. Ask them how that trip was. Be intentional about it. We have a love or hate relationship with our calendars. This is a beautiful way in which we can check in and use our calendars for good. So just make those notes. The other last, the, sorry, the last piece of this, when you're starting small, is don't forget to play. Don't forget to have fun with this. Experiment with this. Get a little wacky with it. Get a little goofy with it. Experiment in meetings and just see how you, what you can do in different meetings and what you can discover and what you can ex extrapolate from those. So I'll tell you a story. Who's familiar with Priya Parker? Anybody? Okay. Um, so she is a gathering facilitator. Highly, highly recommend her book, The Art of Gathering. It's amazing. So she was facilitating for a consulting company in Singapore. Their corporate culture was such that the client always comes first. If the client calls, if the client emails, it doesn't matter if you're out with your family at dinner, it doesn't matter if you're in the middle of a meeting, you drop everything and you take that call. That was really causing problems for her two-day workshop that she was doing because people were showing up late to sessions and it was just wreaking havoc. The existing corporate culture did not serve the container of her two-day workshop. So when somebody ran in late, somebody jokingly just said, make them do push-ups. And we all know that moment where there's like, that sounds ridiculous, but there's kind of this silence in the room. <laughs> and everybody kind of like looks at each other and like, yeah, let's make them do push-ups. It's exactly what happened. You had women in heels, you had men in full business suits, like doing 10 push-ups in front of everybody else if they showed up late to the meeting. And it became, this was organic. It just became this fun thing. They shut the door at the time when the meeting was supposed to start. And so people were racing down the hallway trying to get in before the door shut so they wouldn't have to do push-ups in front of their colleagues. And it became this fun, playful thing. It became a container. It became a mini culture. So they carved out this mini culture inside their existing corporate culture to serve the container of this two-day workshop. That's an example of playing. That's an example of seeing what you can discover in these smaller meetings, in these smaller containers. Key takeaways. I'm actually not gonna tell you what to take away from this. I'm really curious, I would like to hear from you. What stood out? What are your key takeaways from this? Start small. Start small. Start small. And you can, and from, from my point of view, see progress. Yeah. Little bit, little bit, little bit. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah, go. I like your small moment tip about using your names. Mm -hmm. In our virtual world where we do I am a lot, <clears throat> I have a coworker, we work really closely together. And a lot of times I'm just like, how are you? I blurted yeah. it out in an I am. So it's becoming conscientious of that, that I'm going to make myself use my name more, even in an I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I will, I love that, and I'm going to take that one step further. In a virtual environment, we've got Slack, we've got the IMs, you know, whatever tool you're using, Teams or whatever it is, and then we've got Zoom. And we're all so sick of Zoom, okay? We don't need any more Zoom calls. We all agree. Can we all agree to that in this container, right? Okay. We have forgotten about the phone. Just pick up the phone and call your coworker and ask them how they are. It'll surprise the hell out of them. <laughs> and they won't expect it. But truly, just pick up the phone and say, how are you? I was thinking about you today. That's going to go a long way. Well, I have a thing I add to that. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I had uh, actually when I 
interviewed um, at the Wall Street Journal, I wrote handwritten notes to the VP and whatnot. And he left the company six weeks later. And by then I had moved, in, you know, moved to New York with the company. And he's clearing out his office and he comes by and he slaps that note. Six years later, he puts it on my desk. And he says, I still have this because it stood out. So yeah, handwritten note. I'm a big fan of the handwritten notes. All right. Yeah. Building that type of personal connection. Yeah. And I love working and supporting her. Yeah. Yeah. Handwritten notes go a long, long way. So phone call and handwritten notes. And then the last thing I'll say is going back to listening. We all felt the power of that active listening when we did that exercise, where the person wasn't reflecting, they weren't listening to respond, they were just listening. And then in their reflection, you felt seen, you felt heard, you felt validated. And so let's not forget about the power of listening. Because when a company or an individual listens with their head, that person will feel heard. When a company or individual listens with their heart, that person will feel seen. When a company or individual listens with both, that person will feel like they belong. That's all I have for you today. <laughs> we are right at time. I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any, but. And also, please reach out to me if you want, and then I'm going to give you this. So. Yeah. My question is um, you know, one of the things with the mini culture that we created. As you said, you kind of played a trick on us, like you do. <laughs> and so, and then, you know, people share that they felt safe sharing because it's like, I don't know these people, it's not mm -hmm. going to come back to me. You know, how do you overcome that in the workplace where people are feeling open enough to share their challenge? Or, like, you could ask that question and people yeah. feel safe. Yeah. To, you know, hear them and no repercussions, but they're not going to see the person. You know? Right. So, what would you say about that? Yeah, so the question was, how do you replicate kind of the mini culture and the yeah. sharing? Like, because it's easy to share with strangers. Right. Yeah, people, right, like exactly. That. I would go back to start small. Yeah. Start with the one or two word check-in. Start with, and the thing is, it's like, there's an infectious energy that comes with you showing up first and sharing openly and sharing vulnerably. It's all about safety. It's all about psychological safety. And there's certainly some people in every workplace that you just don't feel psychologically. That's OK. It's OK. We don't have to whack every mole here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would say just start small and find the one person that you can actually maybe stretch your previous limit with. And just see what that's like, and then maybe add on a different person. But it's just this slow process of like finding your true people and kind of testing things out. And so it's just like, go, go fishing. <laughs> yeah, is that helpful? Yeah. OK, good. Any other questions? All right, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>